Well, good morning, Blanc Church. How's everybody doing this morning? Very nice. I have had an awesome, uh, awesome time. I've been here a couple days. We went up, uh, I guess you guys call it up the mountain uh, this week, and uh, we had a biker's retreat with uh, Roadhouse uh, Biker Church. Uh, Believe it or not, they asked me to come and speak uh, because you can tell I have so much in common with bikers. Uh, but I promised them by next year, I'll try to have a tattoo. So, um, but it was awesome. We had a really good time. I think last night we had two people that gave their life to Christ, two more that rededicated their lives to Christ. And this is awesome. It was a good time. So, uh, myself and, and Scott and, uh, Brad, John was up there doing worship. And, uh, so we had, this has been amazing. So it's been a great time. I'm really excited to be back here. Um, like I said, or like Scott said, we're going through the book of, uh, Samuel. We're talking about David right now. This has been one of the most difficult messages that I've ever tried to prepare for, and I have no idea why. Some messages are topical and different things like that, and you can just, you, you just find it. You just find a nugget, and as soon as you start studying and researching, it just hits you, and you, you kind of, you're like, okay, man, yeah, I got this. This is one of them that's a little more difficult. So uh, we started a couple weeks ago, and Brad talked, uh, I think Brad did the first, did he do the very first week of this series? Brad talked about Saul, setting up Saul, who Saul was. And uh, this is when the nation of Israel, uh, God and and, and Samuel were kind of talking, and they were were kind of overseeing the nation of Israel at that time. But then they decided, the people decided that they really wanted a king, right? And uh, because for some reason they didn't think that, I guess, God was good enough. Uh, Everybody else, every other nation had a king, and they wanted a man. They wanted somebody to be the king. So we see, uh, uh, basically, God gives his, his, uh, his okay for Samuel to, to go to Saul and say, Saul, okay, uh, we've decided that you're going to be the, the king. And Saul is a, uh, a, he's stereotypical, what you would think. Good looking, strong, strapping guy. And uh, so he becomes uh, the ruler over the nation. And, and he starts out really well. Everything starts out pretty good. Humble, obedient. He does what God asks. Um, he is finding favor. He is winning wars. And, and so we see things are pretty good at first. And then Scott last week talks about how we introduced the character of David. And um, this is David, you guys probably remember, uh, if if you've grown up in church. If not, uh, David and Goliath, maybe you know the story. Uh, David was small, uh, insignificant, right? And and so there's this battle with the the Philistines, and that's the big, the, the, the people that they were always in war with. And, and this guy comes out who's just a little shepherd boy, and he ends up being the hero of the story. And this is how we see the path of David get started in the book of Samuel. So we're going to pick it up today, and this is when things start to go south for everybody. All right, so we're going to pick it up, and we're going to be in uh, chapter 19. And so it says this, and Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, we'll talk more about that in a little bit, and to all his servants, that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, Saul, my father seeks to kill you. Therefore, be on your guard in the morning, stay in a secret place, and hide yourself. So if you're wondering why, it seems like we just kind of all of a sudden jumped into what, wait, wait, what, Saul's trying to, what are we doing here? So David now has killed Goliath, right? And the people are like, whoa, man, that was impressive. So he starts to, to build up a little bit of a crowd, right? A little bit of people that are like, man, this guy is pretty legit. And then he goes out and he, he wins more battles and more battles. And David is starting to get um, a lot of, you know, favor with the people. They're, you know, there's, he's starting to get a lot of publicity. And then there's this one point where, where he goes out and, and he wins this battle. And when they come back, the people are saying, this, this song or whatever, and basically they're saying, David has killed tens of thousands, and Saul has killed thousands. And Saul's like, whoa, wait a second. Wait, you know, I'm the king. I'm the king. And so you start to see this jealousy start happening all of a sudden where Saul's like, man, I don't like this. And the weird thing about it is that Saul and David were very close. David stayed right. He sat at the table with Saul. So it's very interesting that they were very, very, very close, and then all of a sudden, not so good. So we go on, uh, and, and let's go to verse 3 there. And I will go out, and I will stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I will speak to my father about you. And if I learn anything, I will tell you. So Jonathan's saying, hey, man, I'm, I'm going to let you know if, if my father's got a, a problem with you. And Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, 
Let not the king sin against his servant David because he has not sinned against you, because his deeds have brought good to you. For he took his life in his hands and he struck down the Philistine, and the Lord worked a great salvation for all of Israel. You saw and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood by killing David without cause? And Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan. Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. And Jonathan called David. And Jonathan reported to him all these things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul. And he was in his presence as before. And there was a war again. And David went out and he fought with the Philistines and he struck them with a great blow so that they fled before him. Then a harmful spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand. And David was playing the lyre. And Saul sought to pin David to the wall with his spear, but he eluded Saul so that it struck the spear into the wall and David fled and escaped that night. So he has now lied to his son. I promise before the Lord I will not hurt David. The very next Interaction that they have after that, he throws a spear and tries to kill him. So it's safe to say that, that Saul's having a little bit of a mental meltdown, all right? He is derailing completely. And so we see Saul's jealousy completely overtake his heart. So here's this servant David. You would think a king would be pleased uh, when, when you have a servant that goes out and wins your nation battles. You would think that you would be pleased with that. But he couldn't do it because the pride and and the issues that he had. And then there was another situation where um, the, 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 the Goliath situation, they're setting on these, these hills. And, and I don't know if you remember this part of it, but for 40 days, Scott talked about this, right? I think Goliath, Goliath is taunting the Israelites. Hey, why don't you guys come down here and fight? Why don't you guys come down here and fight? The only person that was willing to do it was David. So you have King Saul, a king, a mighty strapping stud of a guy, and he won't fight him. And so this whole army is sitting there watching, and they're going, wait a second, our, our king won't go fight this dude, but this little dude David goes down there and whips him. Of course, the army's going to start going, man, who's, who's the real guy here? But you would think that he would have been happy. He has a servant that's protecting his country, that's fighting, that's obviously found favor with God, but he didn't. Then there's Jonathan, the son. This is the most interesting character, I think, in this part. Jonathan is the heir apparent to the throne. He's the oldest son of Saul. So you would think, especially in today's history or today's modern world that we're in, Jonathan has everything on the line. Everything. If, if he goes against his father, then he probably loses the inheritance. If he goes and helps the servant, he is probably going to go against his father. And at that point, his father will probably try to kill him. So think about the integrity and the godly man that Jonathan is if he's over here helping David and saying, hey, David, I will, I will protect you. I will make sure that my father doesn't hurt you. I will give you. This is crazy. It's a crazy, crazy situation that Jonathan's put in. So how does this apply to us? And this is the part that we're trying to figure out. You have three different people, three different stories. God gave every one of them a purpose. He gave every one of them power or authority or a choice. A choice. Saul, you have been given the title of king. King. You have a choice now. Do you want to honor God because he has given you the title? You are the first king. Now do you want to honor God? Saul chooses not to. David, you are a servant. You are a lowly, poor servant, shepherd boy. Do you want to honor God? You have a choice. Because if you do want to honor God, I will raise you up from this poor little helpless shepherd boy, and I will make you something great. We know that David becomes the king. You have Jonathan. Jonathan, you know what's right. Do you want to do what would honor God? Or do you want to do what would honor your father? Jonathan, you have everything at stake. Everything. You could go from being the next king to being poor, broke, out with the pigs. Jonathan, you have a choice. What do you want to do? That's the life application that we have today. If we were to take a 30,000 view of this, like 30,000 feet up, and we're looking down at this whole story, and we're seeing uh, guaranteed success and victories and all this thing, and then throwing it away and all these, we would probably ask our questions, 
How, how does this really apply to us, what, what's happening there? Here it is. You and I were handpicked by God. We were made in the image of God. We were guaranteed success and victory. Why do we throw it away? Why don't we trust God? Why don't we listen to him? How many times do you need to see God do something amazing in your life before we trust him? To be quite honest, man sometimes is an idiot. He doesn't feel really good when it it's us, when it's turned on us, when we evaluate ourselves and we go, okay, uh, God has, has given me what and have I been thankful? God has done what in my life and I have trusted him. I have gone through this season of my life. I have been whatever, broken, sick, poor, got through it. And did you give God the credit? Did you see the victory? Did you see the success? Did you see how you overcame it? Did you feel like God walked through it? And furthermore, the next time you go through a situation, do you find yourself going, where are you, God? Where are you? God, where's my victory? We should be able to face trials like nobody else. See, people that don't know God should go into everyday situations, and they should have fear. They should be nervous and they should be worried. But as Christians, we shouldn't have that burden. God gave us victory. Whether we're Saul or we're David or we're Jonathan, we should go into every situation knowing God has given us victory. Every time. How could Saul have those victories? Watch a kid take down a giant. Be handpicked to be the first king and not be able to humble himself before God. Probably the exact same way that sometimes we refuse to do it. And here's the thing it's not an accident. Nothing with God is an accident. He is a sovereign God, He knows. If you're here today, there's a reason why you're here. God knows why you're here. You have a purpose, you have a choice. Too many times we look back at the trials that we've gone through and we have these aha moments like, wow, God, you really worked a good one in that one. God, you were really there. And then the next one, we completely lose him. Everything is a choice. I want to tell you the best I can about how this relates to my life. So, when I moved back from Florida, and I think I've shared some of this with you guys before, but when I moved back from Florida, uh, I always told God this. God, I'm okay with doing ministry. Uh, I'd like a break, but if you want me to do ministry, Lord, you open a door and I'll go through it. I will, I will go through any door that you give me. So I go to this church in Joplin, Missouri, and I think I've told you guys a little bit about this. It was the fastest growing church in the United States. And I was there uh, because they found out what I did in Florida with Scott. I was trying to just attend and hide in this church. But they found out, hey, this guy used to be a creative arts pastor at a big church. We really need that position. So they came to me and they asked, hey, would you be willing to work here at our church? And I said, oh, man, God, I, okay. If you, you know, I said if you ever left the door open, I'd go through it. So I go to this church. And this church is, man, it's fancy. It's, it's, it's one of the biggest shiny toys I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, but... I have never, ever, ever been so miserable in my entire life in ministry. Never. We had 10 full-time people in the first year that I was there. Eight of the 10 quit because it was so bad. The pastor was just, I can't even tell you. And so I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, kind of like, like David. Why? Like, God, you opened a door and I said I would go through that door. Why did you do this to me? I have never been so miserable in my entire life. I don't even want to do ministry now. This is awful. I was angry, really, really angry at God. I didn't ask to come to this church. They asked me, and here I am, and I've served you, and I've tried to serve you well, and I've tried to, I've tried to be good, I've tried to be faithful, I've tried to trust you, but this is awful. I was really upset. Here's what's crazy. This is not a lie. The pastor there, I can't even tell you the, the feelings I've had towards this man. So much anger. So much anger towards this guy. The night before I fly out here, I am sitting at the high school baseball game. 
and he walks around the corner because his son plays for a team that our team is playing. And I make eye contact, and I'm like, and I've been writing this sermon where I knew I was going to talk about this. I have not seen that guy in like three years since I left there. And he walks around the corner of the concession stand, and I'm like, you got to be kidding me. So I spend the next 45 minutes talking to him. And God, I think, has a sense of humor sometimes. Uh, you should see me and my wife's marriage. Uh, my wife, I promise this is, this is my, we've got a dog now. My wife thinks that our dog likes to watch cartoons. So, uh, and it, makes me, it drives me insane. It, I can't even tell you. And she literally will tell me, she's like, well, Frozen is his favorite. I'm like, that's not even true. And she's like, yeah, when, when, the, when the trolls come out and they start singing, she's like, he gets really excited. And I'm like, babe, this is not happening. So anyway, I, 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 this is true. I come home and I've just had this 45 minute conversation with this pastor that I'm just like, man, when I saw him, I'm like, should I hit him? Should I, you know, but I did okay. I got through it. 45 minutes we talked and I kind of, and I felt like God was just trying to tell me something. This is a true story. I walk in the house and the song, Let It Go is playing. And I, listen, I don't know if God uses stuff like that, but I took it. As soon as I walked in the house, I was like, I just hear, let it go. And I'm like, okay, okay, I'm going to let it go. I'm going to let it go. So, so I get through that season of my life, right? And I go, I get a phone call because I'm like, God, please let me out of this place. Please let me out of this place. And, and, and I think, I can't remember if I've told you guys this story or not, but, but the preacher that I couldn't stand, I can't believe, I, hopefully he doesn't watch this, but I couldn't stand him. And he's preaching about Joseph. And he's preaching about this series, and here I am up in the tech booth, and I usually don't listen to him, I tune him out. And, and he starts preaching, and God's like, listen to what he's saying. And I'm like, I don't want to. And God's like, listen to what he's saying. And he's preaching about Joseph, and it's about, think about Joseph's story. If you don't know it, Joseph didn't do anything wrong. He was thrown in a pit, and he was sold by his brothers into slavery, and he was in captivity, and all these other things. Joseph didn't do anything. He, he honored God the whole time. And he just kept being a victim of, like, bad things. And here I am sitting in this tech booth, and I'm listening to the preacher. I can't stand preach about this. And God is like, do you hear what he's saying? Be like Joseph. It doesn't always make sense. It's always not fair. Life doesn't always, but God's got a point. He's got a purpose to your life. If you trust him, he's in control. Whether you like your situation or your circumstance, God is in control. And that's what we see with David. Dude, I'm doing everything I can to honor you. I'm going out and I'm fighting these battles for our, our, our country, our kingdom, our nation. My friend Saul, who, who I set at his table, now all of a sudden wants to kill me. What have I done? So I leave that church. Finally, I get a phone call from my home church, the one I grew up in. And they wanted to know if I would come back and help fix it, I guess. I don't know. So I came back, and I was really excited. I was going to be back with my parents and, and my friends and my family and, and all that stuff. I get back there. And this church has got about 100 people on a great day. A great day. I'd say closer to 80. And the guy preaching there was a, a guy that, um, I guess at some point our church ran out of money. or I don't know what happened. But he was a country boy, never preached before. And he used words that weren't even real words. Um, one, of them, one of them that he, was, he used a lot was supposed to. That's not a word. Um, supposed to is not a word, but he loved that one. But anyway, it was rough. And the worship was rough. Uh, we, had, we had a girl that uh, led. Um, she, she couldn't sing, uh, but she was the only one willing to do it. So I got brought out of one situation into another situation where I'm like, God, I feel like you just keep punishing me. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't understand what I'm doing here either. And so uh, it was weird. And so, but here's the thing. I, I felt like God had told me, hey, trust me, trust me, trust me, trust me, trust me. So the first phone call that I made was to a guy that came from that other church that I couldn't stand, but he was super, super, super talented, and they never used him on stage. Uh, he's actually been out to California a couple times just to lead at huge churches, and he was like 19 years old. Super talented. So I called him, and I'm like, hey, bro, um, why don't you um, come over to church uh, and, and serve with me? And he's like, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know what I'm going to do after college. And I'm like, hey, we'll take you for six months, man. I'll take you whatever I can get you because it's pretty rough where I'm at right now. I was honest with him. I was like, this is rough. So I just didn't understand, though. 
uh, God, what, please tell me you got a plan here, man. So Jordan ends up coming over to our church. Uh, our pastor, the one that's supposed to, he, he kind of derailed. And we ended up uh, bringing in another guy, a younger guy. And man, everything started to click. And um, it was amazing. It was amazing. And in that moment, I realized something. God put me at that really, really, really bad place because my whole purpose was that I was supposed to meet Jordan. And that one day that Jordan and I would do ministry together. And God was like, I'm going to put you in this place for a little bit. And if you just trust me, i got a plan. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. It doesn't mean it's going to be fun. But if I called you into this place, I have a plan. So this Easter, we had 510 people at our Easter service in just a couple years' time. I look back now, and I think about that horrible, horrible experience I had at that church, and I am so incredibly grateful. Not because it was fun in the moment, because it was awesome to get to watch God's plan unfold. Do you trust him? You have a choice. When it hurts, when it's hard, when it doesn't make any sense, do you trust him? I remember going to my wife, true story, the first week that we went back to that home church. We walked out into the car, and I told her, I said, babe, we were kind of visiting, and I said, babe, I think God's calling me to come back here. And so we went to church, and we came back out, and this is where I grew up. My wife had been there. We got married in that church, but things had gone pretty south since we'd moved away. And I'll never forget, I was looking at her in the car, and I said, what are your thoughts? And she started crying, and she said, I feel like I just took an elephant dart to the throat. She was like, that was the worst thing I've ever experienced. And I was like, awesome, because I think God's calling us back here. Um, so my wife was like, are you sure? And I was like, I think so. And she's like, are you sure? And I was like, I don't know. And I took a pay cut. I lost my insurance to go back to that church. And it meant that my wife had to get two full-time jobs to pay for our insurance. So my wife looked at me, and she was like, I don't know if I trust you, but I trust God. So my wife worked two full-time jobs for a year so that I could go back to this church that was dying. But she thought that God had a plan. And so she said, I trust God. Since then, my wife has got another job, and she has been promoted to the VP of sales and marketing, and she is doing really, really well. She no longer has to work two jobs. Now, is that a coincidence? No, it's not. I think God was looking at my wife, and he was saying, do you trust me? And I think God was looking at my wife and saying, you have a choice. You can support your husband and you can trust me. Or you don't. And I think my wife would still be having to work two jobs. God's got a plan. He's got a plan. But sometimes... It's even scarier than just a work situation. I don't know if you guys know this. Uh, I can't, I, I'm sorry, I have, I've had a lot of brain injuries uh, through the years. I can't remember the things I've told you guys, the things I've said to you guys. When I was out here last year, um, I had just got out, uh, had a little scary incident and had to go to the hospital. Did I tell you guys about that? I don't know if I did or not. So, so I, uh, I was sitting in, uh, I, I went home from church. And uh, I was eating a sandwich, and I forgot how to eat a sandwich. That should be your first sign, especially if you guys know me. I've never had a problem remembering how to eat. But I was sitting there, and I couldn't think. I couldn't eat, couldn't chew. And so I was able to text my wife, like, help. So my wife comes in there, and, uh, and she knows something's wrong with me. And she takes my blood pressure, and I think it was 70-something over 40, something like that. I just remember she, she got me to the car, and we're, we're driving to, to the hospital. I do remember my wife yelling at me. Uh, she's a great woman. She, awesome, awesome, awesome wife. But she was, she was very scared. And when she gets scared, she, she yelled at me about eating Little Debbie's and bad health. And 
this is what you get for your bad decisions. Why do you do this? I just, and I, and I remember when I got better, I was like, babe, that felt like a weird time for you to yell at me because I thought I was dying. Uh, we've worked it out. We're good now. Um, but, but I got to the hospital. We had no idea what was going on. We got, I got to the hospital and, uh, and they start running tests. And, and so I had a large heart. My lungs were collapsing. Uh, I was in kidney problems and something else. A lie. It was a, it was a pretty good list going. And uh, they, they weren't really sure what had happened. They just told me to drink more water. I was like, okay. Uh, seems like a lot of things for water to fix, but whatever. Uh, and so, so I started drinking more water. And then I found out, um, I came out here. Uh, I was still fat, I think, when I came out last time. Right? Yeah. Scott says yes. Okay. So I, I was still a pre- pretty big, beef, beefy guy then. Uh, and so I went back to the doctor. And the doctors, uh, they told me, they said, uh, Kyle, you're in stage four kidney failure. And I was like, oh, that seems, I don't know how many stages there are. But four seems like it's pretty advanced. Uh, and so it's just one of those moments where, where you're, you're really confused. I mean, I'm at a church right now that's growing, and I feel like God's got me right where he's supposed to have me, and all these things are going good. And, and uh, man, living the dream, right? I mean, I'm in line with, line with God. Like, I've, I've been obedient. I've done everything I'm supposed to do. And then all of a sudden, I'm, I'm sitting in a hospital room, and they're like, you're in stage, stage four kidney failure. Like, God, what's the plan here? Like, what are we, what are we doing here, God. I don't, I don't understand this one. But then I have a choice. All right, God, what, what are we doing? What are we going to do? And it's quite simple. Here's what the doctor said to me. And it's, it's pretty, pretty, pretty full, profound, I guess. Maybe, maybe, I don't know if you need medical school for this. The doctor basically said this. You're fat. If you lose weight, I think you're going to get better. Okay. So, so I get on a diet. I lose 60 pounds. Yeah, I was pretty happy about it. Uh, it's, yeah, they told me I was losing too much weight too fast. And I was like, okay, now, now you're just messing with me. Um, but anyway, I, I, I lose this weight, and, and they start doing tests, and all of these results start coming back, and everything's much better, and I'm, I'm doing better, and I'm stage three to stage two, whatever. And it dawns on me. I had a choice to be mad at God. But what if God was saying, you're not going to be around much longer to do ministry unless you get healed. Maybe God had a plan. Maybe I sat there that day not able to eat and not able to speak because God was like, if you don't change, you're not going to have a ministry anymore. All right, God. I could be mad. I could be confused. Or I could say, God, I trust you. Pretty much that simple. So, what's your story? What's your testimony? Who are you? Are you Saul? You got a pride problem? An ego problem? Suddenly you start thinking that the victories you've had in your life are because of you and not God? Pay attention. Saul forgot where he came from. Saul forgot who gave him victory. Are you David? Are you David who says, no matter what happens, God, I'm giving you the praise. God, I will go fight the battles in your name. I will trust you. If you put a Goliath in front of me, God, I will pray up and I will go fight my Goliath. Are you David? Are you Jonathan? God, I don't care how hard the conversation is, I will honor you. If I have to look my spouse in the eyes and say, we got to talk about this. You're out of line. Are you willing to do it? Are you willing to go to a friend or a coworker and have a conversation that could be hard? Or a conversation where you tell them how much you love them and care about them? No matter what it costs. Are you Jonathan? What's your testimony? Are you able to look back in your life at some point and say, Listen, I was here, and somehow I'm here. That wasn't a coincidence. I think God was a part of that. Are you in a bad spot right now, and you're hoping it gets better, and even in this moment, in this bad spot, can you sit there and go, God, I trust you. I'm going to have the band come up. 
That song that we sang right before I came up, I want to sing it just one more time. Because if you think about your circumstances and you think about where you're at in life and you think about the hope and the potential and all these things, do you trust God? The key to this is what are you pursuing? Are you pursuing God no matter what the circumstances? Do you feel like God's pursuing you? If it hurts, will you still pursue him? If you're broken, will you still pursue him? If it's going to rub somebody the wrong way and it's going to be a tough conversation, will you still pursue him? If right now your health is horrible and you don't know how to fi- still pursue him, will you trust him? Life is a choice. God will continue to bless you when you stay humble and obedient. But it's always a choice. Amen. Today, maybe you uh, feel like you're in a valley or maybe you're on a mountain and you just feel like you're going through life and it feels like moments where you're just questioning where is God and what is he doing and why is he allowing this? And I want to encourage you. It's even in the midst. This is the same God that we read about, even in this story with David, is the same God that is working in your life as well. And all we're called to is trust him, be obedient and follow him, and his ways are always straight. I want to encourage you today. The first place that that can begin is with prayer. And in just a moment after our service, our prayer team will be up front. Prayer is powerful, and it can begin the process for you as you go through whatever season you might be going through. I promise you this, God has a plan. If you have a kid or a youth, I encourage you, stop by the welcome. I believe this summer is going to be a summer that changes lives, and all we have to do is help our kids, the next generation, take that step. With that, church, I love you. I'll see you next week. Have an amazing Sunday. Hey guys, I really hope this message was uh, encouraging to you today. That's right, my wife and I are so honored that you joined us in this way. And we'd love to encourage you. Uh, One, if you'd like to connect with us more, uh, if you live locally, and uh, we'd love to have you visit us in person. If you'd like to join us in the mission here and uh, partner with us, uh, we'd love for you to receive all of that and even other messages, and you can find all that at this resource right here. Thank you so much for joining us.